Hey everyone, <laughs> thanks. thanks for the invitation, thanks for having me here. Um, so as, uh, as already said, I will talk today about a topic that I've been looking into uh, during the past two years, uh, namely understanding implicit regularization of gradient descent methods. And, um, and this is, so, so what I'm talking about today is, is joint work with several people. Um, so people from the RWTH Aachen, where I was as a postdoc, and also with a PhD student from the Technical University in Munich, um, where, uh, where I did my PhD originally, and with whom I still am in contact. Um, right, and to, to give you a, a rough overview over the topics of this talk, um, basically, I will first start with an introduction into why are we even interested in something like the implicit bias of gradient descent. And then I will present three pieces of work where the first explains a bit how we get from deep learning to simple settings like matrix factorization and what we can say in those simplified settings. Um, then what can we say in, in even more basic but underdetermined situations like sparse regression. And finally, I will talk a bit about, and you can see it as an outlook, it's the most recent part of the work, um, what we can use the implicit bias then also in other, in other settings. Um, so let's ju just start with a, with a general motivation. Probably most of you know already about that deep learning is a hot topic at the moment, and um, via deep learning techniques, many problems are solved uh, that haven't been solvable in such precision uh, up till now. And probably you know more applications than me. The thing is, the main problem is that we don't have a real theoretical understanding why it works. And to, to understand what the problem with the theoretical understanding is, uh, let's, let's just think about classical um, supervised learning. So this is the classical setting of machine learning. Namely, I'm giving I'm given some training data, x i y i, which might, may be in whatever space I like. Um, x i are the input data, y i are the output data, and uh, or the labels. And I have some kind of a hypothesis class of functions that might be the explanation to this data, I guess. And what I do now is normally that I say, okay, to find out which is the best explanation. I minimize a loss function and I add some regularizer. The loss function just compares how well my age predicts the data. So if I put in xi, is it close to yi? And my regularizer might implement something like, well, if there are many age that are good in the first sense, then maybe I want that I have a simple explanation. So r could be a regularizer that tells me age shall be a possibly simple function. And um, this is the classical setting of supervised learning. And what could happen can be described in those three pictures. Either I have, so the green dots are now my training data. I have x and y, so it's just one dimensional. And either I have too few hypothesis functions, which means my explanation that I get doesn't describe the pattern beneath the data. I could have a good class of hypothesis then um, I would perhaps get a good approximation of the data. So you can think about this is just noisy samples from a parabola. Or I have too many explanations, which means my explanations can even fit the random noise which is on the data. And this won't give good prediction if new data arrives. Um, in the same way, I could say if I have a very large hypothesis class, this corresponds to solving my, minimizing the loss without any regularization. I just pick any age that perfectly explains the data. This would mean I have many explanations, but by good regularization, I pick a good explanation. And this means I regularize too much. So I put so much emphasis on a simple explanation that I don't explain the data anymore. Now, the, the question in deep learning is, um, the hypothesis class of neural networks, of deep neural networks, is really large. It has millions of trainable parameters, and basically it can approximate any function class you like. So you should always be in the third situation if you don't regularize. 
But if you train your network with gradient descent, which means solving this loss minimization without any regularization, you get good explanations, so ones that generalize well to new data. Which means, in fact, just doing unregularized gradient descent, you end up with such a solution. And this is kind of the mystery of deep learning because so far there is no real explanation theoretically that such good guarantees hold. So um, this is why I'm looking at simplified models and why I want to understand what is implicit regularization. And now that we have clarified this, I will tell you about how we get from a general neural network training towards a simplified um, analyzable model. And um, for this, let's just put this supervised training um, into the framework of neural networks. Don't be scared if you don't know neural networks too well, uh, the notation is not that important. Basically, a neural network is a concatenation of simple functions, and the simple function is a fine function to which we apply some nonlinearity. The nonlinearity sigma are called activation functions, and they are just fixed. Um, the layers are, so the, the inner matrices WK and BK are called weights and biases, and they are trainable parameters. So my network H is parameterized by W and B, so by all those matrices and vectors. Now what I'm doing in supervised training is, I just put some train, I use some training data, XIYI, and I minimize some loss function over the prediction of my network H. And the minimization takes into account all the W's and B's as parameters that can be tuned. And you see, if such a network is deep and has huge dimension, then there will be millions of trainable parameters in this problem. So it's highly non-convex. The question is, why does vanilla gradient descent, if we apply it to it, um, why does it find good networks and not just fits the noise perfectly and gives us rubbish. And here we need to, to simplify the model because it's really complicated for analysis. So the first assumption we could do is to say we look at a specific loss function. And we pick the quadratic loss because it's a perfect example for a loss function and it has very nice properties. So our loss here is now just the squared differences of our input and our output. The second thing that we do is we forget about nonlinearity. So in fact, we say our activation function is just the identity, which means we get a product of affine maps, and we even forget about the biases. We say they are zero. So we only have the weight matrices and the product of them, which is now basically a product of matrices. And since we are not happy yet, first we rewrite this thing um, because what we got there can be expressed in this form where x and y are just matrices that have columns that are the data. So the ith column of x is xi, the ith column of y is yi. And if we assume that our input data x spans the input space, then basically the product here is uniquely determined. Namely, we can just forget about the data and see that this product, if we minimize, as a global minimizer, it will always end up with this matrix, which is y times the pseudo inverse of x. And here we end up with a simple model. So this is now something where we can write down explicitly what gradient descent is doing and where we can do real theoretical analysis. So let's forget all about neural networks and just concentrate on this thing. And we can see this as matrix factorization. So we have some ground truth matrix W hat. And we want to use gradient descent to find uh, decomposition of the matrix into the product of L different matrices. Gradient descent in this context, um, I, I will write it down soon. But what we use as assumptions is that all the dimensions are just the same. We have only square matrices. And the idea behind this is that we don't want to explicitly bring in any bias. So if one of the Ws would be much smaller in dimension, it would mean that the product would have automatically low rank. Because just by enforcing low dimensionality, we would enforce low rank. 
And this we don't want to do. The second assumption is purely technical. It, uh, it simplifies analysis because by assuming that the ground truth is symmetric, um, we know that it has a full eigenvalue decomposition. And now we can write down what gradient descent is doing. Basically, for each of the factors wj, we update by doing gradient descent steps. Um, and the gradient is taken off the loss function, which is this squared norm, where all the other factors are, are fixed. Now, we abbreviate the loss as this L. We abbreviate by, with WK the k at the kth step, the product of our WKs or Js. And alpha and eta are para parameters which, uh, which control the magnitude of the initialization and the step size. And this will stay the same for the rest of those, uh, those results here, alpha and eta from, from the meaning. OK. What can, we, what can we expect? So we know if we run gradient descent and it converges to a global optimum, then the product will be w hat. But we can check what the trajectory of gradient descent is doing. So is something interesting happening here? Um, and the second interesting question is, what role plays the depth? Because we see in neural networks that the depth of net network has a huge impact on the, on the successful training, which means if the depth is a main parameter, hopefully also here some impact is shown. Okay, we are not the ones who invented this simplification. Um, I just here collected some results that were out there when we started our research. Um, basically, they often restricted themselves to the two-layer case, so they couldn't really um, get the influence of deeper factorizations. And what is more, that most of the statements are weaker in a sense. For example, here, they assume that GD converges, which is not even guaranteed from the beginning on. Um, and only for in the limit case, so in an asymptotic setting, they show that there is some implicit regularization. But what all those works agree in is that the implicit regularization in such a setting is towards low rankness of the product matrix. So the iterates of our product, they somehow have a tendency to be low rank. And there are many others. So all of them are somehow into this direction. Um, so as I said, what we did in especially was that we really used the simplicity of the model to give a complete quantitative analysis and um, quantitatively also um, yeah, express this, this low rank bias of, uh, of the iterate. Okay, and if anything is unclear, because now we get into the statement of theorems as well, just, just ask, interrupt me. I, I can summarize the insights first. There are three main insights. First, if we initialize by alpha times identity all the factors, so exactly alpha times identity, we have a very interesting spectral cutoff. Then the WK will converge to some W infinity, which is U lambda plus U transpose, where U contains the eigenvectors of our ground truth, and lambda plus is the diagonal matrix of the diagonalized ground truth where the, zero, uh, the, the negative eigenvalues are set to zero. So in this setting, we lose the information of negative eigenvalues. And since many other works concentrated on the positive semi-definite case, this they didn't even notice as a special feature. The second interesting thing is, if we perturb the initialization by just a bit, so if we take one of the factors to be initialized by something a bit different, then the product converges to the ground truth. So it seems that this spectral cutoff is rather pathological and does not happen if you do a random initialization or something like that. And the third, which is maybe the most important, um, because this is about the real implicit bias, is that if one uses the quantitative results in the first two points, one can explicitly uh, predict at which time the iterates will have a certain effective rank and how it evolves. Um, and now that I showed you those things 
on a high level, let's look a bit into the details of them. Or are there questions at this point already? Okay. Uh, here. So this is now converging to the real ground truth. Here, it converged to something where only the positive eigenvalues are, are there. So here, in this, in this sense, you converge to something where the negative eigenvalues of the ground truth are lost. So you don't converge to the ground truth. In this, you converge to the, to the ground truth W hat. So there is a, is a real difference in where you converge to. Okay. This is how a theorem in this setting looks like. And I don't want you to, to get into all of those details. Let me just highlight a few important things. Um, first, of course, you have some bound on the step size, and this bound depends somehow on the depth. But it's not really important what exactly it is at the moment. Second, you have here the convergence to this positive thing. So you have this clip, this, this spectral cutoff. And here you get a quantitative error bound. So the error between our product matrix and this, this spectral cutoff lambda matrix, if you diagonalize the, the, the iterates, you can quantitatively describe the error by an epsilon if the number of iterations is greater than a certain expression. So this is what the result tells us. If I initialize all with alpha identity, I converge to this thing, and I can quantify how close I am after a certain number of iterations. And this matrix is just a diagonal matrix that contains on the diagonal the error in the different eigenvalues of my W hat. Yes? Right, so, so for example, I say epsilon shall be one tenth. So I want to approximate uh, the, the lambda i up to one tenth relative error. And then I can compute this time depending on lambda i, epsilon, alpha, and eta. And it tells me after this many iterations, uh, the, the error in this eigenvalue will be, be below this, this threshold. Now, what is this time? It's a horrible expression. I won't even write it down in detail. Most importantly, it consists of two parts. A first part that only depends on the initialization magnitude and the ith eigenvalue. So it somehow depends on how, how large is the ith eigenvalue in comparison to the operator norm. And the second term, which logarithmically depends on how close do I want to approximate. So I pay a certain number of iterations regardless of epsilon. And then in addition, I pay logarithmically in the, in the resolution that I want to get. And you see here, there is an influence of my initialization. So this depends. Um, and also here, you see an, an effect of the layers. But it's a bit harder to, to really write it down in an in a easy, well, in a parsable way. So most what you what you should uh, take from it is that uh, in the end if you take more layers then you wait longer but the transition gets sharper in a sense and this we will also see um, in in such plots so if we just look at at a ground truth uh, w hat that has four eigenvalues which means it the dimension is i think 200 by 200 it doesn't matter it's a rank 4 matrix it has 10, 7, 5, and minus 5. You see that the eigenvalues of the, of the iterates, so W are the iterates, they approach the true eigenvalues if they are positive, and the negative eigenvalue just stays 0. So it converges to the 0. And what you also see is the larger the lambda i, the sooner it is recovered, and, um, and this is what you see also here, if lambda i is larger, then this time gets smaller. And here you also see the time that is predicted by our theorem to get an epsilon approximation. I don't remember what epsilon was in this plot. I guess something like one tenth or similar. 
And you see it is kind of precise where the transition is. Let me briefly talk about the proof. The main idea is that by using the identical initialization, the iterates all are diagonalizable by the eigenvectors of the ground truth, which means we can reduce the dynamics to eigenvalue dynamics, and they decouple. So we have one-dimensional dynamics. And each of those dynamics, those are the gradient descent dynamics, can be then translated into gradient flow dynamics. So we forget about the discrete form. We make it continuous. From this, we derive our, our times, so the t's. And then we only need some additional technical effort to link it again to the discrete dynamic. This is what happens. So all this spectral cutoff comes from this ODE. There somehow the negative eigenvalues get lost. So what happens in the perturbed case? We only change the initialization for one of the factors by some beta. What we now get is that we converge to the ground truth, and our error term works for any lambda i, also for the negative ones. But if they are negative, then it somehow uh, includes the, the absolute value of the eigenvalue. And what is more, here we get a different time. So it's not the, this t identity anymore, but we have a different t. So to see the real difference between the two theorems, one needs to check what is the difference between this TP and the TID, which we had in the theorem before? And you see, if the eigenvalue is positive, the time is just the same. So for positive eigenvalues, this perturbed theorem gives the same output. For negative eigenvalues, we have two terms, um, where first we need some time to converge to zero, and then at some point, one of the factors flips its sign, and we get the t identity, um, so the time that we computed in the previous theorem, only for, for the absolute value of lambda i, and with initialization beta instead of alpha. So it seems that we pay in addition for negative eigenvalues in terms of time and iteration. And the, this can also be observed. So you see the plot from before, but with perturbed initialization, Lambda equal 5 is still the same, but lambda equal minus 5, which has the same magnitude, but minus takes much longer. So first, it somehow converts to zero, and at some point, one of the factors flips sign, and the product goes to minus, uh, to minus 5. Now, what is different from a theoretical point of view? The thing is, you do the same decoupling argument, but you get different dynamics for the first factor and for all the other factors. For the positive lambda i, you get the same result. You only need some more technical effort because you have two dynamics that you need to control. But if your eigenvalue is negative, then you get two different, so, so, and you look at the difference between the dynamics of the first factor and the remaining factors, then the difference between those is monotonically increasing, while the difference of the squares goes to zero. Which means the factors, if you square the eigenvalues, they converge to the same thing, but at the same time, the eigenvalues in the first factor and the eigenvalues of all the remaining factors increase in difference. And the only way this can be resolved is that one factor converges to the negative eigenvalues and one to the positive, and, and the remaining ones to the positive. Um, and then you need even more technical work to, to control those, uh, those discrete systems. Right, and this effect of the, of the strict positivity of uh, having alpha identity even gets swallowed by some, by some programs like MATLAB, because we found out that MATLAB makes uh, errors in computing numbers if they are close to zero by just swapping randomly the signs. So if you work with MATLAB, be careful with that. Python doesn't do it. We don't know why, but uh, if you in MATLAB use the alpha identity, you also recover negative eigenvalues. Okay, and this was basically combining all those quantitative results 
And here I write it for a positive semi-definite matrix because it's a bit simpler. Basically it says if you use the quantitative analysis, you can tell me an epsilon and I can tell you a time interval in which the, iter the, the WK, so the, the kth iterate of gradient descent, will have an effective rank that is close to the effective rank of the best rank K approximation or rank R approximation of the ground truth. Important to notice here, the effective rank is basically a continuous version of the rank. So it's between one and the rank of the matrix. And if you have something that is close to a rank one matrix, it's also close to one, but something like 1.1 or 1.2. This is the real rank R approximation. So the cutoff, you take the matrix and you take the R largest eigenvalues or keep them. So what does this strange thing mean? Let's just look at it in a simulation. So if we run our simulation, here we see the error between W and W hat, so between the case iterate of the product and the ground truth. It drops and eventually reaches zero, basically. And here we plot the effective rank of the product. So at the case iteration, this is the effective rank of the product. And what we see is that here are plateaus at which the effective rank of those products stabilize. And interestingly, those plateaus correspond to plateaus where the training error stops decaying and has some intermediate balance. And our theorem, those blue shades, basically are time intervals where we computed that the effective rank of our matrix is close to the best rank one, rank two, and so on approximation of the ground truth. So here, ground truth is 10, 5, 1 eigenvalues. The best rank one approximation only has the eigenvalue 10. So the effective rank of this is 1. It's 10 over 10. Effective rank 1, effective rank of the best rank 1 approximation of W hat. If we take the best rank 2 approximation, the effective rank is 10 plus 5, 15 over 10, 1.5. This is exactly the level of this plateau, best rank 2 approximation. And you could go on if you would have more, more eigenvalues. So you see, by, by you, just by looking at quantitatively how do the eigenvalues of this product matrix evolve, one can understand why is there some kind of an implicit bias towards uh, low rank matrices. And the measure one needs to use is the effective rank. Okay, this was the first load of things. Um, <laughs> are there questions on that already? Yes? In fact, the depth appears in all those times. And since in the talk it's hard to parse them uh, if you see them as, uh, as a thing, um, I can tell you this, that um, if you look at those plots, basically the number of layers um, influences at which time those things appear. Um, and at the same time, they also influence uh, what, is the, what is the slope of this uh, transition. And in fact, this, this agrees um, with the theory in the sense that um, you, you get a later, a later transition because you make some, well, it's, it's hard to, to, to see in the, in the numerical experience because if you have more layers, your step size has to be smaller, which means more steps also correspond to not definitely more way you, uh, you go through uh, since, yeah, it, it's a bit hard to, to numerically compare it exactly. Um, but basically this is, this is the effect in which theory and, and numerics agree that the transition gets steeper and um, the time when the transition starts uh, changes. Yeah. Okay. And in the same way here, this time interval changes depending on the number of layers. Yes. Yes. <laughs>
Um, basically, if you want an intuitive explanation is that um, your alpha, if it's small, then you are close to the zero in the beginning, right? Which means um, this is important that you, that you really see this, this um, bias towards large eigenvalues. Because if you start small, then the large eigenvalues of the ground truth will make the dynamics grow fast in those eigenvalues of your iterates, while the small eigenvalues are less attractive, which means after a certain number of steps, which is much earlier than for the smaller eigenvalues, you already get a good approximation of the large eigenvalues. If your alpha is large in the beginning, then this effect, this separation between the speeds, will not take place as is. Yeah. It, it appears in the, in the step size choice you can use. It appears in the time uh, that eigenvalues are approximated. And in this result, if your alpha is too large, then basically those things become empty. Uh, so this interval is just an empty interval, which means that you don't have a time point where the effective rank of this thing is approximated. Yeah. And those t's look similarly ugly as the t before, which is the price of a quantitative analysis. OK. So what we were not happy with all this uh, was about was that um, basically the ground truth is uniquely determined and with it the global minimizer of the whole system. So if we run gradient descent on this functional, we know where it ends. Of course, we have some insight on how it approaches the, the minimum in the end, but we don't really have an implicit bias in the sense that there are many solutions and gradient descent picks one of them. But um, the thing is, we could introduce such uh, multiple, um, multiple minima by introducing some subsampling. And this would be in the form of compressed sampling like problems or sparse regression, where you have a measurement operator, so some subsampling procedure, which means you don't get your full ground truth W hat, but you only get some measurements of your ground truth. And um, since in this case, um, this leads, if we do this in the matrix case, this leads to a very strong coupling of the waves. We decided to look at a simplified setting where we look at vector sparse regression. And since maybe not all of you are familiar with that, let me briefly give you the, the idea of what is behind. Let's assume we have some unknown signal x and we get measurements y. So now x is a vector and y is a vector. x is just higher dimensional than y. Um, and we want to recover x from y. Then, in general, this does not work because, well, linear algebra, um, we have less measurements than, um, than unknowns. But if our x has a certain structure, like, for example, sparsity, then we can even uniquely recover if m is much smaller than n because m needs to dominate the intrinsic information, so the sparsity. Um, Right, and the support is just the number of non-zero entries. So, no, the support is the index set of non-zero entries, and the absolute value of the support is the number of non-zero entries. So S sparse means there are at most S non-zero entries in X. And you see if we know where they are, the system becomes solvable if M is greater than S. Now the thing is, in classical um, compressed sensing or statistics, you would solve such a thing by doing an additional regularization of the, via the L1 norm. So you would search for a solution that explains the data, and you would take one that minimizes the L1 norm, and this normally gives you a sparse solution. So the L1 norm is a regularizer to enforce sparse solution. We could now ask if gradient descent worked for the matrix setting, Shouldn't it also work for this setting, forgetting about the regularizer and only taking a product of a Hadamard product of vectors here? So instead of minimizing A, Z minus Y in L2 norm plus some regularizer on Z, we minimize A times a Hadamard product of multiple vector Z minus Y. So in some sense, those are the layers of the of the over parameterization. Okay, 
question, do we see some implicit bias here as well? And um, also here, there were works before, but what, what was the problem with most of them was some of them had a suboptimal sampling complexity. So if you wanted to recover a S-bar solution, you needed at least S squared entries, uh, S squared measurements. If you are familiar with this compressed sensing business, you would rather expect something linear in S because you have S unknowns, so you would like to have S measurements. And other works uh, which looked at gradient flow only could give a non-asymptotic bound or what you need for initialization for the two-layer case. And we were interested, again, for general layers. Now, what did we get? So basically, if we take this overparameterized functional and we apply gradient flow, so here, important, we do not look at gradient descent. We just look at the continuous flow. If we do gradient flow for each of those factors and initialize them again, all with alpha identity, which is here the one vector, then there are three things. First, let's see. Yeah. First, our limit lies in the set of positive solutions. So again, we somehow don't get negative entries of our solution. It's again this identical initialization, we get non-negative solutions. Second, we have a technical assumption here that at least one non-negative solution must exist that our theory works. But I'll talk about that a bit later uh, again. And third, we could say that if our, for any given epsilon, if our initialization magnitude is smaller than some threshold, then our limit is approximately an L1 minimizer among all positive solutions. So there is, again, some implicit regularization. And the implicit regularization is minimize the L1 norm, independent of whether there are any conditions met by A. And this time, as you see, if we have more than two layers, becomes better. So uh, the, not the time, the, the initialization magnitude alpha, the requirements get better. Here, alpha needs to be exponentially small. Here, it must be polynomially small in the parameters which means taking deeper factorizations um, well reduces the requirements on the size of the initialization. And this wasn't observed before. Now, the question is what do we do if we want to recover all of the entries? What could perturb the initialization? But this we haven't analyzed indeed. We have used a different approach. We just made our overparameterization more complex. So we had two factorizations, one positive, one negative. And now you see those could recover the positive part. Those could recover the negative part of the solution. And in the end, if we formulate our theorem again, it becomes like that. We have the, the more complex um, overparameterization. Our assumption is there exists some solution. And the limit, which is now the difference of those two u and v limits, this um, is a solution which minimizes the L1 norm among all solutions. So by making the overparameterization a bit more complex, we got even for the identity initialization basically the same result for all vectors. And I want to mention this more complicated overparameterization was not our idea, so this already was observed in other work. Uh, we only adapted our theory also to this setting. When did we start? Okay, yeah, perfect. <laughs> Let's say 10 minutes. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to give you a short idea of how the proof worked, because here I think it's more insightful, um, this, this so there's an interesting theoretical tool how, how one uses it. And since the, the idea is already in the positive case, we just look at this simpler form. So we have this loss function, an L, L over parameterized, Z1 to ZL, L different vectors. And this is our original form. We use X tilde to denote the product. And we have this gradient flow. Now, 
what were the things we needed for the proof? First, we simplified our loss function um, and the dynamics. Second, we characterized the limit and proved that there is a limit. And third, we used this characterization to show the L1 regularization for small alpha. Um, the first step is quite simple. Basically, one assumes that all things are initialized the same way. So here the identity initialization is not important at that moment. It's only important that all are initialized with the same values. Then you can just exchange the flow by a flow that is on a simplified functional. So you don't have L different factors, but they are the same all the time. And you can just look at a functional of that form. So you see the difference before you had L different factors. Now you can reduce yourself to a functional that only has one x, which is raised to the Hadama power L. Yes? In, in one sense, yes. By, by saying, well, this is a good point. In fact, if you look at this, you say, well, there is no over-parameterization now because you have exactly n parameters. But the point is that this now is a completely different functional in the sense of doing L2 regression. So, so if, you, if you have, so basically what this thing tells you, if you do the over-parameterized functional and you start at the same point, the dynamics behave like an L2 regression where you changed your L2 functional. So somehow this, this functional forgets the over-parameterization but keeps the effect that over-parameterization has. In, so this is the way you think about it. And this, of course, is easier to analyze. So for the second thing, you need to know what a Bregman divergence is. If you don't know what it is, it's just a way of, of measuring distance in some sense. And we used a very special one, which looks for L equal 2 a bit different than for L greater than 2. But in the end, it suffices if you have in mind it's a Measure to, uh, it's a measure to measure the distance between some p and some q, some two vectors. And what you should maybe know is that it's always non-negative and it's strictly convex in the first component. So it has some nice properties. Now, what did we do? We showed that over time, if we look at a, an arbitrary positive solution, and we measured the Bregman divergence to the trajectory of gradient flow, then the time derivative could be expressed in, the, in terms of the loss function. And this is independent of the z, which means for any solution in the solution set, the Bregman divergence has a negative derivative, which only depends on the loss. And this is a very nice observation, because now you see that if x tilde wouldn't converge to a global minimizer, this would always be strictly positive, which means you should decrease here. But the thing is, this, this functional is bounded from below, which means if you go the other way around, that the loss function must go to zero over the trajectory. So you get, global, so you get convergence to the set of global minimizers, just directly from this calculation. With a bit additional effort, you can then also show that there is a limit. It's not that you go closer to the set of solutions and go to infinity at the same time, but you stay in a bounded domain and then you know there will be a limit in some sense. And what is even more important, this is the convergence part. You can characterize this limit as the minimizer of the Bregman divergence, where here the initialization plays a role. So this is now some crazy functional, depending on this f. And you know that your limit is a minimizer of this thing. Yes? Right, here, this is true only if you initialize the same way, whatever it is. Yeah. So, so you mean? Yeah, basically the argument comes in three or four steps. So it's a bit involved. 
um, I would say it's, it doesn't uh, have, so, so it uses basic understanding about what, uh, what a sequence in, in Rn can do, but you need to make several steps to, to get to the existence of a limit. Yeah. So it's not just one sentence like uh, getting the, the convergence to global optimality. Yeah. But it only uses this part and the properties of the Bregman divergence. Okay, and the last step with the L1 regularization. So this is only formulated as a theorem. So if you have identical initialization, then you get a limit x infinity, which has this form. So arc min of the Bregman divergence. And the final thing is to note that if you pick this initialization, then this functional is for small alpha epsilon close to the L1 minimizer. And to see this, if x0 is close to 0, this vanishes, so you have the L1 norm. If x0 is close to 0, this thing explodes, which means the inner product of z with this thing is dominant, which is a constant, and inner product with a constant vector is basically the L1 norm in the positive orphan. So think about we are still in the positive orphan. This is somehow the rough idea of this third step. Yes? The L? Um, the, L, the L only influences this time. So, the, and not time, the, the magnitude of the initialization you need. So, for deeper factorizations, you have less restrictions on the magnitude. So you can choose larger alpha to get the same L1 implicit bias. This is the only influence of the L here. The bias itself is not changing by the depth. Yeah, correct. Okay. And basically what you can see from this is for gradient descent, if you do numerical simulations, it is close, so there's only a theoretical gap of proving that the GD is close. Um, and you get from this near optimal sparse recovery uh, by classical compressed sensing theory. So you can really, without L1 regularization, get sparse recovery. Um, and here is a paper that uses a similar intuition and the same proof in some sense. We only discovered it two months ago, or three, um, which does it for the matrix case in two layers. So this idea somehow was it came up somehow at several points at the same time. Okay. Do you give me one more minute or two uh, to tell you about a kind of outlook? <laughs> Great. Um, so what what we were thinking about at some point was that in those sparse recovery results, people always and ourselves included, always looked at this positive thing as something problematic that we need to overcome because we want to recover also negative things. But in fact, if one looks at it from a different angle, namely non-negative least squares, it is an effect you really want to have. You want a non-negative solution. The only problem with our previous result was that we needed to assume that there exists a positive solution such that it works. And this was only a technical thing in our proof um, that we then attended. So let me just let me just briefly tell you what non-negative least square is about. Basically, you say you want a positive quantity because your physical system says that your density is positive, so your unknown thing should be positive, and you want the best solution, the best explanation of your of your data. So it's again this linear regression model, but here you, you assume that you want a positive solution among all possible ones. And since probably your y cannot be explained by the data if it's positive, um, you want the one which minimizes the error in L2 norm. And this non-negative least square problem appears in many places. So now the thing is, um, can we use our observed restriction to the positive please solve this problem by gradient descent without any regularization. And in fact, by, by extending or generalizing the proof, we can remove the assumption that we need a solution. And the interesting thing is that 
with even if we if we don't have this the solution we get will be in this non-negative least square solution set. So the limit of the gradient descent will just be in the possible set of possible non-negative least square solutions. If we use our simple uh, over-parameterized functional. And sorry, gradient descent, I'm talking about gradient flow, of course. Um, and in addition, if we assume that our initialization is a small scaling of the one vector, we get an additional L1 regularization for free. So we can even have two different types of regularization, non-negativity and um, sparsity, in the problem without using any regularizers, but tuning this, the initialization. In fact, this first result, solving non-negative least squares, works for any scaling of the initialization. So here you don't need to, to care too much about the initialization. Um, right, and with that I'm basically finished. So this last part, the, the first two parts are already archived. The last part is uh, in the final stage. Uh, so, um, right, this hopefully soon appears. And um, as a conclusion, you can take away from that um, by a core part of this implicit regularization thing is the factorized model. You see, we, we threw away non-linearities, we threw away biases and everything, and we still, could, and even the data, and we still could see kind of implicit bias towards simple explanation, um, which means the crucial part is this, this factorized structure. And I would say the, the most interesting thing about, about those simplified settings is that it's not restricted to deep learning. So I think there are many more classical problems that one might approach by just using the implicit bias of gradient descent. And um, this allows uh, to use much theory that gets harder if, um, if you include projections or stuff like that to, to project onto feasible sets. Um, right, and with that, I'm happy to answer questions.